Welcome back to How to Be a Better DM, the official podcast of Monsters.Rent. I'm Justin Lewis. And I'm Tanner Wayland. And we are here to help you tell better stories for yourself and your players as you dungeon master sessions of D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. We'd like to give you some quick announcements. We actually have one before the show. And then after the show, if you want to stick around, we have some more announcements then as well. Uh, But first, let's talk about this. Tired of being alone? Are you tired of not having any of your players understand you? Are you tired of never truly belonging? Well, you're in luck. All you need to do is join the Guild. The Guild is a unique and exclusive experience that is only open to Dungeon Masters. It is a full community focused on helping ease your DMing burdens. Want to meet other DMs? Join the Guild. Want to discuss your homebrew ideas with people who would appreciate it instead of just telling your cat? Join the guild! Want to find a place where all your wildest dreams will come true? Join the guild! Go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free. Wait, that can't be right. Chuck, Chuck, can you check this again? Is this supposed to be... What? Oh, it's... They're serious? It's free? Oh. Okay, all right. Yes, go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free, even though they are crazy for giving this away for free. Common side effects may include burping, sneezing, laughing, breathing, hearing, listening, tasting, farting, critting, sarcasm, and in extreme cases, explosive diarrhea. Awesome. With that out of the way, we can get into today's show. Well, welcome to the podcast. Real quick, Bruce. Let's start with a warm up. You ready? I'm ready. Perfect. Okay, so oftentimes at the start of an adventure, uh, the players have kind of an inciting event. Um, And oftentimes that's like someone near and dear to them. You know, something happens to that person. I want you to come up with an inciting event. And if it's connected to an individual, you know, flesh that out a little bit. Uh, But just something that would be emotionally impactful enough to get a bunch of players going on an adventure the most exciting event in the history of running tabletop games by people are sitting in a tavern <laughs> freaking nail. no i'm just kidding <laughs> amazing where'd you come up with that? <laughs> i personally like to start my games my campaigns with like new players with combat happening in like the first five to ten minutes so what i'll do is i'll have them meet up in some way Usually away from town, sometimes on the road. Even some of, some of that old school Skyrim where you're on the wagon and you're just waking up. But I like to throw them into combat immediately yep. right away. Let them get the jitters out of, out of their system and then push them from there. Love it. Great. And so you just show up immediately with combat. Give us an example. So one of my previous combats was sort of inspired by one of the edition modules, one of the old ones. The dragons where they are in the city just kind of exploring the city slowly meeting each other looking through each other through the crowd and then the red dragon attacks it starts to burn the city around them and it forces them to run for cover dive into some inns and some taverns or the nearby chapel mm. and then fight their way past all the the kobolds and the draconics that's usually kind of how i like to start my stuff something something that really gets the blood pumping yeah i like that because it's like it's action but not I mean, I think a lot of people, when they think of action, like right from the get-go, they think, oh, it's got to be like a group of goblins or wolves or something. But you're like, oh, no, they're going to be doing a mix. They're going to be fighting some people, sure. But they're also running for cover, which is like a very intense, like interesting uh, start. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, But let's just, you know, going from here, let's just hop into uh, into the podcast. So, listeners, welcome back to How to Be a Better DM. Uh, I am Tanner Wayland, and I'm here with my co-host, Justin Lewis, as well as Brews from Gaming Brews. He is a wonderful content creator, and we'll have some more, uh, a more uh, in-depth introduction for him later. Uh, but first, some announcements. Uh, first off, um, we just want to say that the September one-shot got pushed to October 1st at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, 
uh, as we mentioned earlier, you will be able to uh, to watch that. Uh, just go to betterdungeonmaster.com forward slash listen. Uh, Sorry, that's that's forward slash watch. <laughs> forward slash like watch. Okay, I was wondering. I was like, oh, that changed. Um, yeah, my bad. <laughs> yeah, you're good. It, we had to change it just because uh, schedule issues. Um, so Justin will be running that one. I'll actually be out of town in Chicago uh, at that time. <laughs> but uh, but it should be great, honestly. Very excited for that. Um, otherwise, uh, as far as it goes... We're going to be doing a giveaway soon on Instagram. Uh, it's our how to. It's at how to be a better DM uh, on Instagram. Um, so make sure to follow us. We'll give you some more info, but it has to do with the software Dungeon Alchemist, um, uh, as they've been so kind and they've given us a, a key so that you can download it. So we're going to be doing a little competition, a little giveaway um, on Instagram. So keep your ears and eyes and uh phone screens open um okay uh also another uh we have one more announcement we have one slot open for the recording uh in october um that's going to be with robbie from this dungeon is occupied or bone daddy as people call him over there uh so yeah we're super excited for that it's going to be horror themed you're going to love it uh definitely sign up for that um Otherwise, we'll definitely catch you in the next one uh, near the end of the year, in uh, November, December-ish. Um, otherwise, let's just hop into this. Uh, so, Bruce, introduce yourself a little bit. Hey guys, I'm Bruce from Gaming Brew. I'm a fifth edition content creator, make a lot of supplemental stuff, classes, subclasses. I also have a uh, pretty good Discord following. We run a, a West March Living World game. I run a bunch of uh, adventures for our team. And we stream it all on Twitch. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. It's a, it's a great time. Great. Uh, great. And uh, we'll have you say it again at the end, but uh, what's your, uh, how can people reach you on Twitch? What's your handle? On Twitch, it's uh, Gaming Brew. It's usually Gaming Brew across the board. Oh, so go thing. to gamingbrew.com and find right, all you my killed stuff. killed it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's great. Don't you love when you find a good uh, handle just across the I board? I was, was at least um, surprised. <laughs> You're like, how does anyone come up with this? We, our whole uh, approach was just make a lot of words, and no one's got to have the same same order of words, really. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how to be a better dad. Uh, anyway, so yeah, honestly, we loved your, uh, your Instagram is just amazing. Um, I've been looking over it recently, and it's just like, you're so good at creating content and it looks so professional and like the the polish and shine on it is incredible um i, I guess my question is how, how did you well first off how did you first get into D? so i've been lucky enough to play D and then second I'm, uh, i've been playing D now for over, over 20 years got my start way back Amazing. in high school freshman year of high school uh so did a did a friend invite you is is that how it you know invite you over <laughs> my my uh my next door neighbor my buddy's older brother and all his friends used to always play down in the basement and we uh kind of went from there oh that's awesome that's great and and so was it pretty soon after that that you started you know home brewing content so it was uh once third edition came out all those years ago third edition just grabbed a hold of me and did a lot of homebrew for that but then uh when fifth edition came around and with the rise of stuff like critical role and adventure time i really got like back to the roots and i really started to dive in to seeing how how big how many people were joining the genre yeah honestly it's incredible and, and so uh so i was curious specifically because a lot of your stuff if not all of it um is about uh it's the arenel fiction uh, fictional universe right yep that's correct uh so, so like uh, tell me how that came about like what is that something you've been working on for years or have you branched out from that like what what was kind of the uh inciting incident with that with the creating that <laughs> so uh <laughs> when critical role was getting really big my uh my fiance and her her brother were getting into it and they wanted to start playing D and they had never played before 
So I wanted to give them a, a homebrew experience. So I started to write Aranel basically around their characters as we ran the campaign. And then over time, it just kept growing and growing, and I kept having to add more stuff, and then more friends wanted to come in and play, and just kind of snowballed from there. And then it just turned into this huge campaign setting. That's amazing. How many people are playing right now? In, uh, so I run a campaign every other Friday with uh, five really close friends, and then we have a couple of great DMs in our Discord that also run campaigns inside the fictional world, and then we all come together. There's about 30 of us that do the, the living world, the West March. Tenor, can I ask a question real quick? Please do. Awesome. Uh, so, Bruce, uh, what you said just sparked a big, like, interest in me personally because I'm actually trying to kind of flesh out one of my own homebrew world. And uh, obviously that's the selfish reason why I'm act- asking this question, but more for the listener, <laughs> more for the listener, quote unquote. Um, in creating a homebrew project, a homebrew world, uh, it is a pretty intense undertaking. And the way you described it was very interesting. You said you created it around their characters and then started fleshing it out uh, from there. So if I can dig a little deeper on that, was it you had your uh, girlfriend and her brother create characters and backstories and then you use those elements to start creating and kind of as the seed for Aranel? Or did you supply them details and then that also became the seed for Aranel? Like walk us through that. So I'm, I know there's there's two ways that people usually go about creating worlds. They usually go top in, like they start with the big universe in the mm-hmm. deities, or they go like regional and expand from there. I started top in, and I had a couple deities for them. I had like an overarching continent for them. And then I waited to see kind of what classes grabbed them. And one of them, one person was like really into like druid circles. So I, I was like, all right, I need to make a bunch of stuff about druids and nature stuff. Another one was really big into holy light and cleric stuff. So I started toss like... Uh, that aspect to them too and then after seeing where they went and just fine tune there and then I just built all the details around their characters and then let it expand out from that direction yeah that's that's great so like do you think that that's the best way you could I mean I, I'm not I don't have any issue with that but I'm like looking back are you happy that you started it like that it just kind of took what they were interested in and built on that versus just I don't know doing a world just off the cuff that isn't necessarily regarding them it worked really great at the time and then about a year and a half or so in when we started to have more and more people interested i uh i pulled back a bit and i went i started uh you know very broad built our our pantheon built a lot of the nations and the armies and really started at the timelines and the universe then i built it down that way and i figured that doing that way it's made it a lot more accessible to everybody you know i went with the it was a pretty major five things that a lot of home brewers use and they go you know geography religion mm-hmm. economics politics and social structure and i really dove into those five things once i had a, an idea of what like made my my setting unique yeah um I, I see that you put out a lot of content as well and so with that in mind like because because you do all kinds of content right like you do you do the monsters you do uh, races, sub races, uh, you know, uh, subclasses, just, just basically everything, right? Um, how do you like? What's your process going into that? Because I'd imagine that if your process was poor, you could only do a few, you know, every once in a while, right? Oh yeah, it's definitely been fine tuned after a couple of years of doing this, but now it's to the point where I'll, I'll put out polls or themes for everyone to vote on and what they want me to focus on for the month. So, oh, that's great. for example, this month is our, our theme is Thieves Guild. So it's all about rogues and Thieves Guild stuff. And that gives me like a good direction. So I always need a little bit of direction for doing creative outlet. Yeah. And then uh, I'm lucky enough to, I can make subclasses or, or races or monsters, whatever really gets a hold of me that day. And then I have uh, an awesome team to play test. And I have like a, a method that I use to play test content. So it at least comes out. I hope it's pretty. I hope it's pretty balanced. I feel like it's pretty balanced, so hopefully it comes out in a very polished state. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like you do a lot more than most people going into homebrew, right? Uh, that's great though, like because because uh, I do love that you get input. Because frankly, like the same for me, if I have parameters given to me by someone else, or like a general kind of uh, thrust of, of what I should be working towards, so much easier. 
like uh, 20 times easier to come up with ideas you know helps to corral the brain <laughs> exactly uh if we can dive deeper a little bit could you describe let's say with the example of uh you know uh magic item or maybe not magic item uh i don't know like a a tree monster i don't know uh what would be your method for playtesting that monster so if i was to do a monster to play test it once you kind of have the cr that you want to do even though cr is a little real wanky for 5e once yeah. you have that cr you you play test it i have a lot of different uh like set i call them training dummies mm -hmm. like a lot of set classes and subclasses built that i can just toss in and i run combats with myself and with other people mm -hmm. we just take it off that way it's also once you make so much content and i've been in fifth edition now for so long it's always a good idea to try to mold it around stuff that wizards has already made the wizards gives a nice once you understand like the theme and how they kind of make their content you can kind of keep yours really close to theirs yeah so kind of using them uh as similar templates or genres to like you know create alongside it so you're not going crazy yeah just like a stencil you can yeah. kind of see they have ranges for their health and damage output in the back of the dmg that really helps out too so you know you don't go too too extreme on damages or too light now we're getting into the, the power creep of the, the set well perfect honestly that's like that, that's a great way to um to put it you know like hey with homebrewing you don't have to learn everything from scratch right you kind of need to uh base it on other examples you know that's that's how most uh everything starts right if you're gonna uh if you're gonna write a story you gotta you're probably gonna base aspects on it on other stories you've read you know <laughs> same if someone's like making uh making a game you know you can't just don't expect to start from scratch uh certainly not at the start right so other than that uh what do you find i mean since you have so much experience with this what are some major mistakes or missteps <laughs> that you've had uh, when you've been home brewing, so my my biggest one, and I was lucky enough to be corrected by some of our very well read and uh, very good proofreaders in our Discord. But Wizards has very uh, they say things a certain way yeah. with how they present themselves and their like features and their abilities and their subclasses. And you want to make sure as a home brewer that you match what they say in all of your stuff. You want to try to you try your best to have the same kind of wording, just so that people that are still learning the game or new to the game and reading your homebrew can pick up on the ideas and, and understand what you're trying to get across in your homebrew. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. You know, just making sure that, uh, that you're just like being very clear. Cause that, that's the thing that wizard kills at. They, they have that way of saying things that makes it so incredibly clear that, you know, you're not going to have players just confused or, um, or, you know, questioning or trying to break things you know in certain ways yeah yeah because that that just happens all the time um and, and so when you've been like creating uh all of these different parts uh of era now um uh what like so aside from like turning to wizards products uh are there any specific products that were like very useful that you reference all the time or any other tools in general, um, or or places for content. Uh, just just like where, what tools do you use typically? I try to just be a sponge and just read as much about different campaign settings as I can, or like checking out uh, the new Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. The the biggest one that's been extremely helpful for me is uh, the Midgard Wo World Book by oh, yeah. Kobold Press. Mm -hmm. They have a, a very large, I think it's like a 500 page campaign setting. And just seeing how they laid out their content, make it like easily accessible, has been huge for me and and setting and planning like what I need to hit, without going like too too detailed because you want to give DMs you know room to, to add their own when they run their games, but exactly. giving them just enough detail like they do in their products, that's been like uh, massive for me. That's great, and I was very curious uh, specifically about. So I noticed that you, I mean, you kind of kill it when it comes to matching. The look you know like each of your posts on instagram i was like so this isn't from the book you know uh like how do you <laughs> how do you like go about creating that is there like a an app or do you just kind of uh 
Photoshop that together. How have you been doing that so far? Yeah, so I use a, a mix. Uh, there's a website called Home Brewery. Yeah, yeah. That you can that does a, like BB code that you can use to kind of put stuff in there, and then I export out of that into my Photoshop, and then I make sure everything syncs up and looks the same. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Uh, I've been lucky to. I'm not much of an artist. But I've been lucky enough to meet some artists that are really good. <laughs> <laughs> I can send stuff to you and are awesome and get back to me real quick. Oh, that's great. Um, so Justin, do you have uh, any questions? Yeah, um, this is one that kind of just came up. Uh, you know, in building out RNL, uh, how have you kind of determined, uh, you know, whether or not RNL has different time periods and eras? Like, uh, have you just decided to focus on one specific? era or have you already established that technology will change or things like that i'm just kind of curious i was always really interested in how players could watch technology like evolve in front of them in real time so for era no there was this, this this big event that shifted the era to the era that the players are in now and at the era that the players are in now it's only been 700 years so it's still very very new world and people are still exploring but all these lost ruins and and whatnot and uh, we've been slowly introducing a big part of the world is there are multiple universes and one universe is very far along in technology and they just started coming to Arano and these are like your they're called exiles in our world but those are kind of like your war forged yeah. so they've been slowly bringing this technology in and then the players have been reacting in real time to like how it goes from flintlock pistols to actual like war bots walking <laughs> around and I thought that was always like a really cool way it's almost like before it hit steampunk, but kind of a steampunky vibe. Mm -hmm. That's what they're getting into now. Fascinating. Wow. So, so then, because based on some of the things I've seen as well, there are classes and subclasses that are geared towards kind of the low fantasy as well as high fantasy. Um, so do you just kind of have a, like a, a reservoir of resources for any time period and then you just kind of slot your players in, in wherever they fit? Or wherever you want them to fit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a pretty good way to look at it. A lot of it is uh, some, because the, the era is so new and they're still kind of getting the feel for it, some kingdoms, some civilizations are you know, much more far along than others that are still kind of prehistoric. But then players can kind of pick, you know, they want to come from this prehistoric place compared to like something that's really far along where they're starting to build like airships and they can kind of mold it together that way. Wow, that's really cool. Um Another question real quick. In in doing all this, how much, uh, or, or I guess what types of research have you done outside of the D&D research, you know, like research on politics or military tactics or economics? Like, have you done anything like that or has it just been kind of all mostly focused on just learning what is in the space right now? I always tell everyone that if I wasn't a D&D &E creator, I'd probably be a history <laughs> teacher. And I, I just love diving into all kinds of, you know, warfare and, how cultures have evolved over time and it's that's been you know really big too for putting the world together wow. any particular resources that you'd recommend to the listener Ooh, off the top of my head uh i think a big thing of it is if as long as you just always have a like a hunger to to read whatever you can get your hands on and then if you can, if you can find parts of history that you think might mesh really well like if you're really into like aztec you could you know read about some of the old Aztec and Mayan stuff, or if you're really into like, uh, I don't know, there's just so much that you can dive into. If you could just take little little bits of real history and mesh it into your world, it not only like adds the details to it, but it lets players kind of feel that they know what it is, and it lets them feel more part of the world too, which has always been a big deal. First off, before we continue, we actually typically take a little intermission and continue grilling you no um <laughs> we can take but uh we just like to you know st uh, take an intermission stretch our creative muscles a little bit um one thing we w we would like to do is uh you know since you're so good at home brewing um let's let's have you home brew um yourself for a moment <laughs> uh oh man it, yeah so uh First off, do you feel like you have a fairly distinct DMing approach? Yeah, I think I do. I think okay. I, 
Perfect. Perfect. That makes this easier. Uh, if you were to uh, create a, um, a class to describe your DMing style, what would it be? Class, I think it would be something very, I'd almost put him like a mix between like a sorcerer and a wizard. Okay. Because I, I'm, I'm a big Foundry VTT user. I like to do a lot of online right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I yeah. like to have all those flashy graphics and spell <laughs> effects and animated maps and stuff. So I think that kind of fits with the spellcaster, be a little flashy. Oh, totally. You know, like uh, I think a lot of people do really well at the, uh, you know, the sensory uh, like impact of campaigns. Yeah, I, I love that. Probably give myself some sort of ability called the rule of cool. I'm always preaching about the rule of cool. It's true. It's it's a really important rule. Honestly, <laughs> does that rule mean that Just rule of cool? Either you can be cool or you can be effective. Is that how that would work mechanically? <laughs> oh yeah, it's like a wild exactly. magic surge. Either you look cool, <laughs> doing something, you get. or you actually do something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you get over a ten, do the coolest thing that you can think of. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so. Kind of a mix of uh, sorcerer and wizard, uh, in terms of just the flashy abilities and everything. Love it. Good, good, good. Okay, so getting away kind of from y- your experience uh, home brewing, and more, you know, uh, let's talk more about like people that are new to home brewing. Uh, first off, do you find that a lot of people are just intimidated? by how good you are at home brewing? I hope not. I, I get a lot of questions. People asking like tips and tricks all the time through social medias and on Discord. Uh, yeah. I hope I hope I answer their questions well. Okay, that's good. Like, I mean, like put their mind at ease. Yeah, and do you feel like do you feel like anybody that is, you know, maybe daunted by the idea of starting a home brewing? Um, I mean, is it is it a scary thing? Is is home brewing hard? Would you say? Let's say home brewing is like kind of learning any other trick of the trade. You just got to do it, and then you're going to fail at it. Then you got to do it again. Then the internet will tell you you suck, then you do it again. <laughs> and eventually you'll get better at it. <laughs> you just can't be afraid to, to fail because you can always tweak the That's numbers. how you know you're making real progress in something, when there's enough people out there that know you're doing something that at least one of them thinks you suck. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> it, it's, it's absolutely true, you know, because like especially – with the amount of content you're putting out, there's there's no way. Like I was reading a comment, actually I was reading multiple comments on your Instagram, because uh, I, I I you know troll through comment sections and see what can make me angry. Um, but I I saw a few people who were like, you know, you had a very cool, you know, sub race or su- subclass. I saw this a lot, where you were like, you know, had this beautiful thing, um, and then they were like, oh, it's just this. You know, and like, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, it's just like That's a good oh, point that already exists, and it's like I, I just thought it was so funny because I was like, this isn't gonna stop him from creating, yeah. you know, but like, <laughs> it'd get easy to be like, oh, am I that creative, you know? Yeah. It's like uh, one of the things with homebrew is you want to make stuff that isn't there that you that your players are really into. So even if it like you're making a sorcerer subclass and it it touches a bit on the bard, it's okay they want to be a sorcerer and you know wizards of the coast makes the official stuff and we we fill the lines fill in the cracks as the homebrewers and actually i would even add that it's also important to like for your homebrew project to say yeah there are elves in this world but they're different in these specific ways and none of these ways are mechanical they're all narrative but these are important reasons why this elf is different in Aranel or any other homebrew project and and that's in my opinion that's still worth creating that content because someone's going to read that and be like wow I really want to be this kind of elf even though none of the game mechanics change the narrative and the way you act will change so I do think that even even if it is the same exact mechanical thing uh, having a different narrative is still important or even if it's the same narrative just so that way people know for your homebrew project right 100%, especially because usually when people turn to homebrew, they've already played 5th edition and they've played through a lot of the the standard stuff for so long they want something a little fresh. And that's really what 
I'm just trying to give, and I'm sure all the other homebrewers are too, just a, a fresh new experience in the same game. Yeah, and what I love is that uh, with, with that viewpoint, you know, it's very approachable uh, for for new for new DMs for new homebrewers, because uh, like I was one post that you had was Orc, comma Aranel race, and I love that. Like I, I hadn't even read it like when I first looked at it, and I was like, oh, I, I love that. You know, that you essentially were like, hey, there's an orc. They're different. You know, you have uh, a different. Um, you know, different ability slightly, but as far as it is, it, it's an orc, you know, but you can still get into it. You can still, you know, uh, scratch that creative itch and make it them unique to your to your campaign and your world without having to be like, no, it's not an orc. It's a, it's a lork <laughs> with an L, you know, like or something, right? <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big part of it. People identify like they know they have an idea of what orc is, and then people will will feel attached to the orc, and then with the homebrew we can make it feel a little different. So it's not like every other orc that they always play. Like my orcs are from outer space. <laughs> That's just a <laughs> little, little tweak of what it is. Yeah, and and changes like so much, and in in a way it actually makes those changes more impactful because you're like, hey, you know what this is? It's an orc. However, you're stereotyped in your assumptions don't quite fit it's 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 different in a certain way right and honestly i think that's one of the reasons why i would encourage the listener to to give a, a try you know try their hand at homebrewing because um we all play D to have adventure at least you know in a fantasy way and uh, kind of have that escape and i feel like by doing homebrew you are making it so you are the only person that can provide that particular story uh, in a sense and, and in a way you're giving something to the world that no one else can because it's only coming from you right great point like uh i've made a uh, spartan fighter you know a shield and spear ancient greek and i'm sure in the home brewers that's like one of the first things that they make but you know i wanted to make one and it's a little different than everyone else's but you definitely want to encourage the next home brewer to also make one and see how fun there's this it's just a uh, Stretching your your creative creative mind. Exactly. Um, oh, so uh, we're just about to end here, but I did have a question that you just something you said just brought it up. So, with you being the DM and also kind of the main person in charge of creating for this world, how often do you invite your players to you know take an active part in creation? I do so in a couple of ways. Uh, one is a lot of people in our Discord have made subclasses in some of the races that are on my Patreon. Give them full credit. We actually have a couple guys that have, were making a couple of things for my Patreon, and they've kind of branched out now, and they're starting to make their own. It's been yes. great too because we have we have multiple DMs, and the way that they go because they use the settings. So whatever they do in their setting, we try to incorporate to get their notes. Try to incorporate their lore into the lore. And then it's just a you know it's a you always want to make your players feel a part of the setting. So whenever a major event happens, like one of our players became king of uh, the Northlands, like a like a Viking establishment. So he has forever cemented his character is now on the on our campaign setting page. He has art and he's he's part of the world. So the story he told in game we tried to, to add it to what we're doing. That's really cool. Wow. I love that. Uh can I ask a uh, one follow up question on that? How and this is me speaking from my uh my uh ego brain, um how do you manage to delegate that creative control to other people who aren't you <laughs> i know that i might have particular problems being like yeah take my homebrew project and do something with it that i may not like but it might be permanent that's a good question i'm also a little bit of a control freak with it too i just tell them going in that i might tweak it a little bit so just be aware <laughs> as you get into it that <laughs> i might make some changes and they're, they're pretty okay with it it's been working really well so far i like it just being up front beforehand with it. <laughs> I love that. Um, I mean, what, what I love, especially what, during our talk today, obviously you are very experienced, you're very good at, at, uh, at homebrewing, and you have this whole, um, you know, uh, Patreon with wonderful content. Um, but you also seem very, uh, very chill about it. You know, you're not like a perfectionist, obviously, and also... Um, you know, 
just like, hey, you can get better at this. I, I love that because I think I struggle the other way where I'm like, oh, I probably have to be great at this before I show it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, we have a, a channel in our Discord that's solely for people to fill out a form and give feedback. And I always read the feedback. And if it's, you know, I've had a lot of really good responses and we've tweaked and changed a lot of my homebrew to, to match the responses. We have all these class updates because classes are the most intensive by far. And then we just keep updating and, and play testing, turn into old content, making it better. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if anything, that kind of shows that, you know, if you're insecure about your work, you should be showing it more, right? Because uh, the more feedback, it's like, hey, if you're so insecure about it, then the only way you can actually make it better, or one of the main ways, is getting that feedback, right? Oh, absolutely. And you'll you'll find, too, as you're homebrewing that um, when people just have better ideas, and then you can, better ideas with what you've already made, and then you can mix it in and just improve what you've made. Absolutely. Like some of my, uh, the best homebrewing I've done has been when I've just bounced, you know, simple ideas off of, you know, friends because I'm like, oh, I think this is okay, but I'm not sure. And then they suddenly have like something that, that makes so much more sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I love that. Um, well, honestly, I think that we've, uh, we've just learned a lot from you today. Uh, we're just so grateful that you came on to the podcast, uh, Bruce, honestly. Yes. Oh, thanks for having me. I've uh, really enjoyed it. It's been great talking to you guys. I was really excited coming up to it. Had it marked on the calendar, ready to go. Awesome. Good. Me too. Me too. <laughs> uh, so how, how can people reach you? Yeah, so the easiest way to reach me is to go to gamingbrew.com. That'll okay. give you the links to all the goods, the campaign setting. We call it the content vault, the, the Patreon with a lot of free and paid stuff. So you can still go out to join. You can still download I think we have almost 300 different PDFs now you can download for free. A lot of creatures, a lot of subclasses. Oh, that's great. And then that's awesome. you can find me on Twitch every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Also on GameBrew.com. That's awesome. Uh, so gaming, uh, GamingBrew.com. Um, and so, yeah, I'm definitely going to be checking out that Twitch. Everybody else, you should as well. Um, and uh, until then, everybody, let's roll initiative. Thank you for listening to today's show. Uh, we really appreciate your support and your patronage. We have a few more announcements to go over. Uh, first, did you ever fall in love with the library as a kid? It was a place where you could experience a thousand stories without having to buy a thousand books. That is what Monsters at Rent can do for your D&D &D campaign. You can rent and swap out as many quality miniature monsters and creatures for your D&D &D party as you could ever want, without having to buy them. You can rescue villagers from a kobold camp, or lead your party through the fighting forest, or many more adventures. We're coming out with new bundles all the time. Just sign up for our subscription to get access to your own personal library of minis. Go to monsters.rent to find out more. That's the website, monsters, with an S, dot rent. Get your library pass to a world of minis today. We also wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Stardust and Dragons. I'm going to let one of the cast of Stardust and Dragons, Christian Hatcher, and his crew tell you a little bit more about it. This August, a new adventure podcast is coming to a platform near you, filled with action, you one of the two of them. We can't right. keep taking hits like that. Drama. Everything that she's been doing, every, she, everything she's going to do, finally sets in. And Stardust. Help! Help! <coughs> Someone! Please! Find out more about this epic odyssey at StardustandDragons.com, where adventure awaits in the stars. That's all the announcements we have today. Again, thank you so much for everything you do for us. You make this show possible. Like we said before, we'll be back next week with another great episode, and until then, let's go ahead and roll initiative.